listen, right now, everyone is stressed out, stressed out with the cost of living. It is a stressful time. There are uh, massive challenges around the world in terms of inflation, in terms of supply chains. Uh, there are wars going on uh, in a way that is putting more pressure on people and, and you know, emotional angst on a whole bunch of people uh, in every community. There is uncertainties. We're still, in some ways, recovering uh, from the effects of the acute pandemic that we just had. Uh, we're dealing with, you know, countries getting more protectionistic in a whole bunch of different ways. There are real challenges in the world right now. And one of the challenges everybody is seeing is climate change. You know, Alberta declared a start to its forest fire season in February this year. We had one of the worst years for wildfires ever on top of some of the worst years for droughts, floods and droughts in different parts of the country as well. The impacts of climate change are real. And they're not just environmental or, you know, community-based. They're also economic. We are seeing that investors from around the world are looking to where they can rely on clean energy, where they can develop some of the climate solutions they have, where there's a, a focus on decarbonizing the processes that we have for whatever it is so that there can be more competitiveness in a world that is adjusting to the fact that we're having to reduce our emissions of carbon in everything we do. That's, those are just the facts. The question is, what do we choose to do with that? What decisions do we make collectively to tackle this problem? Now, for decades now, as people saw the challenges with the environment, the political will just wasn't there because there wasn't enough support for it across the country. Who would want to actually, you know, you know, face a challenge that really is only going to hit a few decades from now? That'll be someone else's problem is, unfortunately, the easiest way to respond to this. We don't have to do anything. It won't hit us now while I'm in office. So let's just push off the problem for more and more people to deal with. The problem is the fact that we pushed off this problem for decades already means it gets more and more expensive to make the changes that are necessary, not just to protect communities' quality of life, but also to protect our environmental opportunities and growth that we have. So the question becomes, does anyone really think you can build a strong economy for the future without, at the same time, fighting climate change and being responsible about the environment. The fact is, you cannot. You can't have a plan for the economy if you don't have a plan to fight climate change. So then the question becomes, well, how do you fight climate change? There are lots of different ways you can do it. You can bring in the heavy hand of regulations to force people to do different things. You can bring in uh, you know, different uh, incentives and subsidies and rewards to you know, invest in companies that are actually doing the right kinds of things. But that all involves the heavy hand of government weighing in on how we're going to do that. I prefer a cleaner solution, a market-based solution of saying, you know what? If you're behaving in ways that are going to cause pollution that is going to impact the whole community, you should pay for that pollution so the community then doesn't suffer the negative sides of it or have to clean it up on their own dime. That's what we do with people spewing water into uh, wastewater from factories into, into streams. We say, no, 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 you're going to have to clean that up. You're going to have to be responsible for the pollution you create. So that's why putting a price on carbon emissions just makes sense. Because a company that says, oh, you know what? I'm going to avoid paying that price by investing in a better type of technology. Well, that just makes sense. And that company should be rewarded. And a company that says, no, I'm just going to continue to pollute, the fact that they wouldn't get dinged for that doesn't make sense either. So we said pollution will have a price on it. 
But more than that, we know there's a lot of families across this country who don't have huge amounts of choices in terms of, oh, I'm just going to buy a, a, a much more fuel-efficient car, or I'm going to replace my roof or my insulation or my windows. That's a hard investment to make. So we wanted to make sure that people who continue to not be able to change much in their behaviors would get that money back. And that's what we do with the price on pollution. But think about a family that does decide, oh, okay, you know what, we can get a slightly smaller car, or we're going to replace our windows, we'll go for the slightly more fuel-efficient windows. Well, they actually get more money back because they're spending less on that price on pollution. So it's a logical way to do things, but yes, it does require putting a price on things right now so that we can set ourselves up for success in the future. And that's an easy thing for short-term politicians, short-term thinker politicians, to say, oh, we'll get rid of the price. They don't talk about the fact that they're also going to get rid of that check, the Canada carbon rebate, that puts more money in the pockets of the vast majority of Canadians. And they don't have a plan, or they don't talk about how they're going to actually use the heavy hand of government through regulations or through subsidies or some other way to pick winners and losers in the economy as opposed to trusting the market. Now, your question, Rick, is sort of, well, that all makes sense. Why are so many people still against it? Well, you know, that's a question we all have to ask. But my job is not to be popular. My job, although it helps, uh, my job, my job is to do the right things for Canada now and do the right things for Canadians a generation from now. 